How are you, Sister Green? See you waving. I don't hear you, but it's good to see you. Greetings, everyone. Good to be back again tonight. It's amazing how quickly the time does fly. And here we are together again on a, another Monday evening or Tuesday morning for some of you. I know watching from uh, overseas, but good to have everybody along. And tonight we are going to be looking at Zechariah um, chapter 3, 4, and 5. Uh, we actually will, will be doing three chapters a night for the next, uh, well, let's see, there's uh, this week, uh, next week, one more week in November, November 30th, and then uh, we will have three weeks in December, and so we will continue with three chapters a night until December 14th, and then on the 21st, we will do the book of Malachi. It's a fairly short book uh, for chapters, but we will we will jump in and get uh, Malachi done, and then we will uh, have a couple of weeks off over the Christmas and New Year um, time. So uh, we will we will just get done as our objective is to finish the minor profits by the end of the year. So we should be in good shape to get that done. So um, we'll, uh, these are not exceedingly long chapters we have tonight in Zechariah. And, and as we go through, many of these are the same. There are a couple of longer chapters, but uh, we'll be fine uh, today. So let's pray and we will begin our time together tonight. Lord, as always, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And we thank you for the privilege we have of engaging with your word, engaging with your thoughts, with your uh, revelation to us. And so we thank you for uh, this time together and for each one who has joined us. And we just pray, as always, that you will open our hearts, open our ears, open our understanding, our, our mind. We want to receive uh, your word and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we bless you tonight and we ask for your help as we approach your word. Feed us, we pray, and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So yeah, it's good to uh, jump back into Zechariah. We're starting at chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, uh, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, uh, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, uh, saying, remove the filthy garments from him. Again, he said to him, see, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house and also have charge of my courts and I will grant you free access among these who are standing here. And so uh, here, that's the first section of uh, chapter three. Now this name, uh, Joshua or Yeshua, as it's sometimes um, rendered, or of course in Greek, Jesus, is what was a, a fairly 
common name back in the day. So when we read this, it's, it's not a matter of just immediately thinking uh, of, of Jesus the Messiah, but I think we will see as we go along that it certainly does come, uh, we will come to that conclusion. Um, but here it's uh, Joshua the high priest uh, standing before the angel of the Lord. And from time to time, we do have uh, this rendering, the angel of the Lord. Sometimes uh, speaking of a theophany, you know, um, uh, God appearing to man in human form. Sometimes speaking of uh, a messenger of the Lord, an angel of the Lord or from the Lord. Uh, sometimes just really representing God himself. And context is what really determines how we interpret uh, this, this particular uh, rendering. Uh, but, but again, in this, in this scripture, we, we start to see, especially as we get down into the second half of the, the chapter, but certainly showing up here, we see uh, God showing himself in, in different ways, doing different things, and we see different aspects of God and his work on display. So here's the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord or standing before God and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. I, I don't think this should surprise any of us now uh, that Satan is the accuser of the brethren and uh, that's his job and he does his job exceedingly well. He loves to, to accuse us. I, uh, I think we give him lots of ammunition to use against us by the things we do and say and um, sometimes we're just not as we should be. So he has a lot to work with and he gladly and routinely stands to accuse us before God. And, and so when we, um, when we see this, we, we see that God has a response to Satan. And, and now we can read this as we would of a royal speaking. Um, the, the queen, when she speaks, she never uses I, she uses we. Um, when you speak of certain individuals, you don't use their name, you refer to their position, their title. And so here, uh, God, the majestic God, uh, is, is just using that title, the Lord uh, rebuke you, Satan. And, and so the, the rebuke is not, it's not something that we look at just from the standpoint of an individual. Now, if you go over to Jude, uh, verse 9, I believe it is, uh, you, you see that, um, yeah, let's just flip there for a second, because it's the same kind of, of uh, deal. Um, Michael, uh, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. And so here is a mighty archangel, Michael. I mean, uh, we, we often think of Michael as the warrior and Gabriel as the messenger. A um, couple of, of these archangels that we are familiar with, but, but Michael, even in disputing with, uh, with Lucifer, he, he comes not in the power of his position as an archangel, but in the power of God. Uh, the Lord rebuke you. So uh, there are a number of things, of course, we pick up from this, uh, that when uh, Lucifer was second to God, he was the anointed cherub. Uh, he was the one who, who God had looked to and said, okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, work through you. I'm going to use you. And uh, until uh, pride and disobedience and all of this, rose up in him. He was in that exalted position, second only 
to Jehovah God. That's pretty high. Um, that is a very exalted position. And Michael um, is dealing with positional power, not dealing with personal power, but dealing with positional power. The Lord rebuke you. You were the anointed cherub that covered, and now you are an enemy of God. And so I'm not addressing you and dealing with you uh, as an individual, Lucifer or Satan. I'm dealing with you and rebuking you in the name of the Lord, the position that is above you. And so, yeah, it, it's very, very interesting to see uh, this uh, interaction. And, and so we can do exactly the same thing as following what the Lord said, following what um, Michael said, and rebuke Satan in the name of the Lord. The Lord rebuke you. And, and he continued to say, indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? And of course, uh, well, not of course, uh, there are commentators who believe that this is referring to Israel being rescued from Babylon. It, it's as if they were uh, a brand plucked from that fire of tribulation. And, and God who has chosen Jerusalem, God who loves his people, loves his city, uh, this is the one who is rebuking Satan and saying, when you look at, at uh, Joshua, when you look at my people Israel, Joshua, the high priest, of course, representing uh, the nation of Israel, you see somebody that I protect, somebody that I love, a nation that I have guarded and, and have delivered. And so this is a brand plucked from the, the, the uh, fire. Verse 3 says, Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and uh, standing before the angel. We will probably see this a couple more times tonight and the significance of this as we go along. The filthy garments, of course, um, we would immediately start to think of of a sinful acts, sinful, uh, sinful nature, uh, dirty before God. Our righteousness, as Isaiah says, is like filthy rags before God. So looking at, at uh, Joshua in these filthy garments brings these things to mind that, that it's that this representative of the people was covered or clothed with sin. And he spoke. So now the Lord speaks again. And he says to those who are standing before him, uh, says, remove the filthy garments from him. Take this sin away from him. And again, he said to him, see, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with festal robes. So here, uh, really, you would look at this and think of this in, from the standpoint of uh, Joshua being a physical priest, uh, and in this vision, uh, standing in the place of the people. Uh, but don't, don't keep far from your mind the fact that, as you have read uh, ahead a little bit, you see the, the branch coming up, and we, we have met the branch already in Isaiah. And we know that it's referring to Christ. And so these filthy garments are being removed. Iniquity is being removed. God is going to clothe Joshua. And by extension, the, um, uh, the nation of Israel with righteousness that comes to us in the book of Romans in particular, that God imputes righteousness to us. He gives us what here is referred to as festal robes in, in, in Romans, speaking to us of, of righteousness uh, as, as that gift, that imputation of God to us. It's, it's phenomenal that by faith, we receive the righteousness of God and we can stand before him, not in our own righteousness, 
But if we are in Christ, if we are covered and washed by his blood, we are seen as Christ is seen in the presence of God. That is pretty phenomenal. And, and, and that's what gives us access and gives us the ability to, to stand in this way. Our iniquity has been removed. And then uh, Zechariah standing by uh, watching this is saying, well, uh, if the high priest has been disrobed, then you know the high priest needs to be re-robed. I mean, those robes, if you go back into Exodus and you read how God uh, robed the high priest with garments that were for beauty and, of course, representing his authority and his position. So, so when you saw the high priest in his robes, you knew immediately this is the servant of God, the representative of the people, and, and we, we need to uh, deal with him in this, in this fashion. And so uh, this, the turban, you remember, that's the, the thing that was right on the top of the high priest garments and um, across the front of the turban that engraved um, a piece, holiness unto the Lord. So Zechariah said, let them put a clean turban on his head. And, and again, let's start right at the top. Uh, with that turban that declares that we are holy to the Lord. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. And so God is watching all of this, okay? <clears throat> the filthy garments have been taken away. The iniquity has been taken away. And, and a clean turban and clean garments have been put on him. Now this high priest representing the people is no longer filthy, dirty, and sinful, but is now in his rightful place representing a righteous people. God takes away the iniquity of his people. And uh, the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, thus says the Lord, in verse 7, uh, if you will walk in my ways and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house and also uh, have charge of my courts. And I will grant you free access among these who are standing here, whoever these may have been. Uh, the scripture is not more specific. But righteousness, cleanliness, purity, holiness allows uh, Joshua to stand in the courts of God to govern the people of God, to have a charge of the temple, the tabernacle, whichever, uh, well, certainly at this time there was temple worship, but hearkening back to tabernacle worship. And I will give you free access to my people as the righteous representative of a cleansed people. All right, so that's the, first part of chapter three, anything on anybody's mind as far as the first section goes. Watching for mics being unmuted, watching for hands going up. I don't see any just now. So since we do have three chapters to cover, I'll motor on. <laughs> so we're in the going to read 8 to 10. Uh, this is uh, God continuing to speak. Now listen, Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you. Indeed, they are men who are a symbol. For behold, I'm going to bring in my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua, on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor 
to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. So, so we have uh, now uh, this, this uh, other, what should I say, a prophetic word used to describe Jesus, the branch. And, and so when we uh, take a look at this, we understand this goes back to Isaiah chapter 8 and uh, the first rendering of that we see what this branch is about. In verse 9, the stone uh, I have set before Joshua on one stone are seven eyes. Seven, of course, being a number of completeness and perfection. I will engrave an inscription of it, and I will, on it, I should say, and declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Now, uh, this stone, I often think of the branch, Jesus Christ, uh, and, and referring to him also as a stone uh, that the builders rejected, that has become the head of the, the corner. On, the, on one stone are seven eyes. We don't have the inscription that is written on the stone, but we do have that God says, I'm going to remove the iniquity of that man in one day. And there certainly was no day like that day, the day that Jesus actually came and removed the iniquity of the land in one day. And in that day, that day was going to be a day of uh, rejoicing. That was going to be a day when people would invite their neighbors to uh, sit under the vine and under their fig tree. Uh, this is what you do in times of peace. This is what you do when everything is, is um, uh, smooth sailing, uh, when you're not at war, when you're not at strife, you can sit under your vine, under your fig tree, invite your friends over and, and have a good time. This will be possible because of the work of the branch. This will be possible because iniquity has been taken away. And, and the high priest of the people, now uh, more than just Joshua, uh, a human high priest, but the name itself uh, represents what's coming, the branch that's coming, the Lord saves. Yeshua, uh, Jesus, the Lord saves. And, and so, so this we look at and get a, a pretty good picture of the fact that, that the high priest Joshua representing Christ and of course Jesus when he came himself were as a representative of the people showed the condition of the people, sinful and dirty. And then God comes along and cleanses them in one day and, and again, through this high priest, now referred to as the branch. And, and you know, we, we think of, of what the branch did in cleansing us. And now we actually can live in peace and harmony in freedom and enjoy the benefits of our salvation and the removal of our iniquity and our um, inability to stand before God because of our impurity. And so that is chapter three. Uh, floor is open again. That uh, anything you may want to say about chapter three, please go ahead. All right, we don't see anyone jumping in, so we will. Now move to the next vision, which is in chapter four. Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who is awakened from his sleep. He said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold uh, with its bowl on the top of it and its seven lamps on it with seven spouts 
belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. Also, two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, Do you not know um, what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit says the Lord. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. And so um, the next vision that he, he sees is of, of this lampstand with its, its seven lamps and seven spouts. So we can think of seven lamps and it seems there were, were you know, feeder pipes, so to speak, coming into uh, this, uh, this lamp bowl. So oil coming from everywhere that allows the light to shine. And when we, when we look at this and, and sort of take it back into, into the um, tabernacle time, we, we understand that inside the tabernacle, uh, coming in from the, the brazen labor and coming in from the um, altar, you would enter into the tent, and in that tent, there was no natural light. The light that was there was from uh, the, the lampstand. You uh, no doubt seen pictures of that and, and not pictures, representations of that. The candelabra with the seven, um, uh, seven lamps. Of course, this is olive oil typically burning through the lamp. You see some that people would carry around a little handle and then almost like a round uh, oil reservoir and sort of pinched on the end where they would put the wick and, and the oil would burn. Um, the light that we have in our lives, we often think of as the word of God. And this is what gives us illumination, gives us revelation, gives us insight into the word of God. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. And so we think of the word of God as that which illuminates us and lets us know how we should walk and shows us the way in which we should walk. And, and so not only do these seven lamps have you know, their individual little bowls and oil reservoirs, they each have seven feeder um, spouts coming into it. So uh, the lamp, the light, the word of God, the instruction of God, it, it's, it's abundant. It's everywhere. We, we don't need to walk in darkness. We do have the light of the word of God to guide us. And so, so let's make use of that. Now, the, the particular uh, word they had at this juncture was that, hey, you need to get the temple rebuilt. And, and these two olive trees that were standing by the lamp, we, we certainly have the combination here uh, as we read in verse six, we have Zerubbabel who represents the political power and we have the high priest. We just read about uh, Joshua, uh, but uh, we, we had guys like Ezra uh, representing the priesthood also in the temple rebuilding. You have the light of the word of God giving illumination and instruction in what needs to be done. You have the political leaders, you have the spiritual leaders, 
the two olive trees coming together to fulfill the will and plan of God. And so uh, Zechariah didn't get it. And the angel said, you know what I'm talking about? You know who these are? Nope. Uh, so the word came to him in verse 6. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so, um, again, you have the light representing the word of God. You have the oil that, that gives the light its light. <laughs> And oil um, often is used to refer to the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit of God that moved on those who wrote the Word of God that gives us light and illumination. So we don't go forward. Zerubbabel was not going forward in his own strength, in his own power. He was going forward in the strength of, of God, uh, in the strength of the Spirit of God in light of the revealed word and plan of God. And this is, again, bringing it into our day and time. This is how we, we have to do it. We cannot um, pretend or fool ourselves to think that it's by our might or by our power. It's not. It's by the spirit of the Lord. And we talked about that uh, last uh, yesterday in our Sunday morning message, our, our spiritual weapons and tactics, the word of God, the spirit of God, that's, that's what we need. So we can defeat great mountains through the word of God and the spirit of God. Verse eight, uh, I'll, I'll just continue reading on. No. Okay. Also, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel these are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. And so, so engaging ourselves in the work of God through the power of the spirit of God is destined for success. Um, we understand that they began to build the temple, their enemies rose up and caused them to abandon building the temple for a little while, we then see that that um, Haggai came along as we as we read uh, in the last few weeks. Haggai comes along and says, "Hey, come on, let's go, let's go, uh, let's get this thing back on track." And here is Zechariah, coincidentally, at the same time, coming with the message to say, "Zerubbabel, uh, you started." and you will finish. God is with you and you will finish the job. And I, I think we can take courage from that. Um, all of these things are written for our instruction, right? Upon whom the ends of the world are come. So whatever job you have started, whatever challenge the Lord has put before you, please don't quit, <laughs> don't stop because God has given you his word and God has given you his spirit and that's what we need and what you have started God is able to give you the power to finish and somebody said amen then I said in verse 11 what are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on its left and I answered the second time and said to him, what are the two olive branches, which are beside the two golden pipes, which empty the golden oil from themselves? So he answered me saying, do you know what, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. 
And he said, then he said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. And so certainly we have Zerubbabel already identified as one of these two um, olive branches and uh, representing the political leadership. And then uh, with, with Ezra or Joshua, wh whichever of these uh, priestly figures we, uh, we had at various times, they, they certainly were along as rep the high priest representing the coming together of the political and the religious for um, doing the work that God wanted done in, in uh, rebuilding his house. Okay, so that's chapter four. Floor is open while I take a drink. Praise the Lord. God bless you, Brother Owen. Blessings. Um, this, the, um, these two olive trees uh, mm -hmm. that uh, Zachariah inquired about, the mm -hmm. south, um, is it representative of the, the, the cherub that are uh, covering the mercy seat? Uh, well, as, as we read through the, the um, chapter, the first time we see them, the uh, Zechariah is saying, "What are these?" And mm -hmm. and and the first response is that this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Okay, that doesn't identify him, uh, uh, you know, immediately there. But we say, okay, uh, we're talking about these olive trees and. We see Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel rebuild the temple, and and then down in verse um, fourteen it says, "These are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth." So right. now, um, again, reading, you say, "Well, how do we bring it all together?" Uh, the the cherubim overshadowing the mercy seat, they they had a particular uh, function as far as just showing God's protection um, and covering over those who are seeking his mercy. And here in this chapter, the thrust of it is, is these olive trees standing by the, the lamps, the word of God and the spirit of God the lamps and the oil that, that allows for the light. And, and uh, all of this is designed to strengthen them to build this, uh, rebuild this temple, not by might, not by power, but by the spirit of the Lord. And, and so that's, it's just a matter of trying to do the math and, and try to pull all of this together. Um, this is a standalone vision. Chapter three was one vision. Chapter four is another vision. Chapter five is a, another vision. So if you look at it as a, you know, just uh, one vision and you see Zerubbabel uh, featured so uh, prominently here, you start to think something about this has to, to do with the, the temple and has to do with with the role of Zerubbabel. And, and uh, so when you think of the two anointed ones standing, you kind of think, well, uh, Zerubbabel is a, a rather prime <laughs> candidate. And then as you read the history of the rebuilding of the temple, you see in particular Ezra representing the priesthood standing with him and, and encouraging him. So, so that's, that's, the typical um, solution to this situation that you will that you will read, as opposed to the chairman um, around the mercy seat. Thank you, sir. 
Go ahead. Not probably not important, but I'm just wondering about the um the identity of that. Like we have Zerubbabel, but could the other one be um, Joshua rather than um, Ezra? I'm just yeah. wondering because um, I was referred back to Ezra because somebody, a commentator, said something about. Um, he mentions that in chapter five, he mentions that Haggai and Zechariah were both prophesying and led to the rebuilding of the temple. And then in after that, in chapter six or seven, where is it? Then it says in the, um, so Ezra seven, it says, now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of who, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, came up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses mm. that the Lord, the God of Israel had given. So I'm wondering whether at the time that that prof, that dream that Zechariah had those, that vision, mm. whether it would have been Joshua that would have been in the people's minds. I don't know. Yeah, so uh, it, it could be Joshua, it could be Ezra. Um, uh, I don't think we we need to uh, it doesn't matter that much yeah. yeah yeah we 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 have these two uh, anointed ones and so along with the Zerubbabel who is the other anointed one that we see in the history of the rebuilding of the temple and it would be the priestly figure so maybe we can just um, leave it uh, as that uh, Sister Sharon, go ahead. Um, Sharon, you'll need to un unmute your mic. Oh, praise the Lord, Pastor. May God bless you. How are you? Doing? God bless you. Okay, back to Brother Owen's question. Does mm -hmm. um, those two olive tree refer to anything um, contrast to Revelation 11, uh, verse 4? Oh, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily just, um, I, you know, it, it says these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of, of the whole earth. I wouldn't necessarily jump there, but by the same token, I wouldn't say it, it couldn't be because um, prophecies sometimes have more than one fulfillment. And so... So it, it, it absolutely could be, and, and, and in that case, again, it doesn't specify exactly who they are, but um, we think of that as um, uh, Ezekiel, uh, uh, Elijah, and uh, Moses, I think. Who were the ones I... I haven't done all my revelation reading uh, lately, but when you when you think of of the law and the prophets, you think of Moses uh, representing the law, Elijah representing the, the prophets, and and so again they're unspecified, but you have the same kind of imagery here as flows in in Revelation eleven. So. But of course, they weren't the ones in particular referred to in chapter four here. Zerubbabel seems to be much more in, in mind because when the question was asked, um, what are these? And you know, the answer was, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. So in, in this case, in Zechariah four, we, we, um, we take this as, as Zerubbabel, but we have exactly the same imagery coming up in, in uh, Revelation 11, 4, uh, definitely. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, Pastor, in mm -hmm. 4 verse, uh, where were we? 2 talks about those seven uh, lampstands and seven pipes and then in four verse oh goodness i'm losing my space here 10 for these seven rejoice to see did you say who the seven were was it who was it referring to the seven 
that rejoice to see. Uh, yeah, so I, I, again, you're, we're dealing with prophecy. <laughs> so it doesn't just give us um, the, you know, every, every detail. I, we don't know who these seven are. It, it is possible that these are um, uh, again, uh, seven righteous people who are looking on and rejoicing uh, at the, the completion of the, the temple. We, we, we don't know. These, it, this just sort of um, drops in there and, and doesn't give us any further explanation. Uh, who has despised the day of small things, but these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. And then it says, these are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. So the seven, um, I, if, if we just take it as, as it reads here, would be a reference to the perfection and completeness of God rejoicing at the completion of the, the work of the, the temple. So that is probably where I would go just because of the internal evidence of, of verse 10, that these are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. Okay, thank you. No problem. Pastor, could that be by chance referred to the seven churches as well? Um, now, you know, as far as what the people would have understood at that time, um, and in light of what the verse actually says, uh, we, we have certainly in Revelation uh, writings to the angels of these seven churches, but, but that would be pretty foreign to the thought of the people in Zechariah's time. There, there was no thought or talk of the church or any, anything of that nature when when did we say this was written somewhere um well just at the end of the exile so we're around uh 585 90 bc some somewhere in there so so i i wouldn't sort of jump to that conclusion um just because of of who it was written to the context in which they heard it and what the verse actually says about the, the seven, and it refers to these as the eyes of the Lord. Thank you. Okay, anybody else with their hands up? I don't uh, see right now. Okay, so we're doing well, we're doing well. So let's jump into chapter five. And then I lifted up my eyes again and looked and behold, there was a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? And I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and its width 10 cubits. So this is like a, a 30 foot by 15 foot scroll. So this is a um, magic carpet scroll flying. Um, it, it's a big scroll. So this, this is a, a scroll of prophetic proportions. And um, verse three, he said to me, this is the curse that is going forth over the face of the whole land. Surely, everyone who steals will be purged away according to the writing on one side and everyone who swears will be purged away according to the writing on the other side. So, so now we, we have actually this, the scroll that is, is again, the word of God, the law of God, um, giving, giving a, uh, giving a, a real indication of the fact that that the people know this word. It is 
larger than life in front of them. And we certainly know uh, from our, our reading back in Exodus, was it chapter uh, 19, chapter 20, when the, um, the law was delivered, it was, uh, well, chapter 19 starts to talk about the, the Lord coming to Sinai and all of the amazing display of power that was there. And then the law in chapter 20 given in, in detail we god came in a larger than life fashion in exodus 19 and this flying scroll is a 30 foot by 15 foot scroll it's massive clearly way bigger than what people would normally um, have seen which would be something they could un unfurl and read in, in their own two hands and and the the point is what is there is easy to be seen, easy to be read, and it is God's curse against sin. And so, so no one can be excused from saying, oh, I didn't see it. I, I didn't read it. It's huge, to borrow a phrase from somebody that's uh, quite well known these days. Huge! And, uh, and so... So the judgment will be uh, against those who, who steal, who swear. I, I think this just represents sin of all kinds. And, um, but it does say in verse four, I will make it go forth. Now this is the word of the Lord going forth and it will enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. And it will spend the night within that house and consume it with its timber and stones. So of course you have very prophetic language being used here. Um, again, if you jump to Revelation, you see, see God destroying armies with, with um, the two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. In other words, he just speaks the word and physical destruction takes place. Similarly here, <clears throat> this word, this curse goes forward. It's a spoken word, but it consumes timber and stones. So it's, it's prophetic in nature, but it's just showing that real physical destruction comes as, as, as the word of God takes its effect. Now, that's not strange or new. Um, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. The Lord said, let there be light. That's just a word. Uh, there was light. Uh, let there be a firmament. Uh, let there be sun, moon, and stars, trees, animals. All of these were words, but they had a physical uh, impact and effect. Similarly, the word of the Lord, the word of judgment, the word of this curse, will have a physical effect on those who are judged by it. And, and that's, again, not strange. It's prophetic in nature, the language, but, but the word of God, the spoken word of God, actually has physical impact and, and power. Verse 5, Then the angel who was speaking with me went out and, and said to me, Lift up now your eyes, and see what this is going forth. I said, what is it? And he said, this is the ephah going forth. Again, he said, this is their appearance in all the land. And behold, a lead cover was lifted up and uh, this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. Now, a typical ephah, uh, it's just, referring to the size of this container. It would hold 22 liters, and typically of, of grain. <clears throat> so, so if you can imagine the 20, 22 liters, uh, a container holding that, that's not big enough to hold a human being. But again, in prophetic language, just like the scroll is enlarged um, way beyond its normal 
size. Here, this EFA is enlarged way beyond its size. And, and so here's this lead cover. Lead is very heavy. You put that cover on, it's not moving. And when uh, the cover was removed, uh, what is inside? Well, there's a woman sitting inside the EFA in verse 8. Then he said, uh, now describing this woman, this is wickedness. And he threw her down into the middle of the EFA and cast the lead weight on its opening. So it was opened to reveal this, um, this woman representing wickedness. And, and then it, she was th thrown back down into the EFA and covered with this, this um, cover to keep her there. Wickedness was, was covered back in this EFA. So uh, everybody with me still? <laughs> so now we have in verse nine, then I lifted up my eyes and looked and there two women were coming out with the wind in their wings and they had wings like the wings of a stork and they lifted up the EFA between the earth and the heavens. I said to the angel who was speaking with me, where are they taking the EFA? Then he said to me to build a temple for her in the land of Shinar. And when it is prepared, she will be set there on her own pedestal. So this is written to Israel, of course. And, and so the judgment of God was coming, as we spoke about earlier, into Israel to those who were stealing, swearing falsely in his name. And I think those are just representative of sins that Israel was committing. And, and so God says, I'm coming to judge. My word is going to judge. And then we have in the same vision, another rendering of, well, our, our, our further illumination on this point, shall we say, that here is wickedness and, and this wickedness that is in here with my people is going to be bottled up and dis, uh, discharged from the land. And so these two women just, again, rep as these, this one woman inside represented wickedness. Well, you have two righteous women outside um, taking this wicked woman in this ephah and where are they taking it? Well, they're taking it to Shinar, which again is another um, a part of Babylonia. So you're taking the sin out of Israel, if you want to call it that, and taking it to Babylonia, uh, a nation certainly well reputed in, in ancient times for their sinfulness. And, and we see that even as we read in um, Old Testament prophecy and history of, of um, people like uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, having a, a statue built to him and everybody has to bow down. Nobody can pray to any other God, but the, this uh, emperor and, and all of that sort of thing. So idolatry was rampant there. And, and so, this woman, wickedness, was going to become another idol that was worshipped by Babylon. And so, so these two women took this, this representation of wickedness. And where is it going to go? Well, it's going to go to a place where wickedness is glorified and where wickedness is worshipped. In other words, get it out of Israel. This is not to be anywhere close or part of temple worship, um, a temple will be built for it in Babylon. And like Egypt, Babylon became just a, a symbol of complete wickedness, debauchery, and, and sin. So, so um, yeah, we, we, we do have that um, here. Mitzi's saying, I think the large size of the scroll is to emphasize how open uh, he's going to judge their sins. Well, uh, certainly, um, uh, 
you know, this, the, the, the scroll is emphasizing, exposing, making it plain that not only is, is sin being recognized and identified, but it is universally known. And when the judgment comes, there will be no excuse. And wickedness represented by this woman in this urn uh, is going to be dispelled from the land and taken to a place where it, it is naturally and normally worshipped in Babylon. So again, the people of God should not be engaged in sin. That's not our place. That's not where we belong. Let's get rid of it. And God is sending his word. God is sending his, his servants, his prophets, uh, those who speak on his behalf to help us. And as we have read countless times going through these minor prophets, just um, repent, repent, repent. Don't continue to live in sin, repent and uh, get this uh, evil out of our nation. So I'm done with chapter six, and uh, chapter five, I should say. And so any comments that you have on chapter five are welcome. Um, I noticed that that woman kind of reminded me of the one in Revelation 17. A lot of this yep. book seems to have a lot of things similar to Revelation. That woman, like uh, in 17.5 of Revelation, on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the yep. mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So again, another woman representative of Babylon and that sin uh, where the nations of the world committed fornication with her. So that wickedness, same kind of woman. Yep. Yep. No, and, and so we, we see um, a lot of similarities be, in between Zechariah and some of the things in, in Revelation. It's, well, and of course, when we get to chapter um, six, that's pretty much the end of these visions that he had. And we go into other prophecies against nations more in tune with with what we have uh, heard before but but in these first few chapters up to chapter six you have these i believe it's eight uh, visions that are 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 just sort of out there and very reminiscent of um, what we see in revelation which again makes sense in the mouth of two or three witnesses let every word be established and we see that what god was saying about and against babylon continues like he doesn't forget he doesn't move on uh, their sin will be judged and we see the the sin being glorified right now in babylon this woman is being taken to a temple that will be built for her in Babylon, but then uh, in the end, it will be destroyed. Uh, sin will be destroyed. And so, so yeah, God is, is continuing the message that um, we need to do right, live right, stay right, and not be uh, involved at all in, in anything that the scroll could speak against or uh, involved in glorifying and worshiping wickedness. Anybody else? Hi, I'm just wondering, I've seen a few, like some um, just like synopses of each one and, and not tonight, probably unless you've already prepared something like this, but I'm wondering if in your perspective, from your perspective, just to connect maybe the visions together a one or two sentence synopsis of each vision just to make a um, panorama view panoramic view of the visions and how, how they whether or not they relate to each other but just like vision one vision two vision three one or two sentences well um... like I'm saying not tonight because I didn't give you preparation but 
Um, and then we haven't done that, the last one that we read or or beyond that. Yeah, all of them like that from 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 two to from chapter one to chapters oh okay yeah six. so um that's probably homework i should give you guys um to have <laughs> people for the two the synopsis um but again, one, one thing you will see, certainly as you go through this, there are, are a number of things here in these first five, and then again, next week in chapter six, things that are very, very um, similar to things we read in, in Revelation. And so, yeah, probably a good exercise. Um, everybody think about that i think that would be if you remind me when we get through chapter six then we can we can take a pause and and try to just go back and uh, summarize what we have read thus far but yeah i think we have um these eight visions and uh, keeping in mind it's one prophet, uh, fairly a short time span, um, all of these were meant to be taken and understood and acted upon in their current time, understood as far as how God was speaking to the nation and, and really viewed as instructive for their present day, even though we have already seen and can, will continue to see how they also have future um, connections with the apocalypse. Okay. So if there's nothing else on anyone's mind, next week we will do chapters six, seven, and eight. And, and so please uh, read ahead and prepare those chapters in your mind. And we will, we will look forward to that. Um, make sure everything is clear. I don't see any hands up and any mics unmuted. So, uh, uh, but I will give you one last chance if you do have something you want to say <clears throat> before we close off for tonight? By the way, it's actually huge. A uh, huge, yeah. Okay, it's not huge, it's huge. <laughs> anyway, we will not get into that, that is for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that that was my sister. Yes, I I recognize okay. the voice. I think I know my sisters. <laughs> so I think you were looking for feedback before about um, books, and I think we talked about Revelation. I think we definitely should do that in the new year. Well, it's really interesting, really powerful. Um, I am reading that right now, and seeing how little I know. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it's very interesting, very interesting. So yeah, we will make that final decision um, certainly by December 21st. And so uh, anyone who has any thoughts on that, where we go after the minor prophets, I'm wide open to the suggestion, but, um, but Revelation certainly is on my mind right now and reading through it and just trying to decipher some of these things uh, in my own mind and thinking so yeah if uh, we have a mind to do that then we'll certainly jump in <clears throat> could you please when you're going through the books mention both the chapter and the book that you're going through, because sometimes when someone joins the meeting late, we don't know exactly which book and chapter you're in. Okay, okay, so I will try to 
keep that in mind. And uh, Nadine thinks uh, Revelation would be a good book to go into. So we have two votes for Revelation right now. So I'll vote once, vote often. <laughs> And we'll see if we can get a result to this election sometime soon. Thank you. God bless you all. All right. So have a good evening. And we will look forward to uh, seeing you again next Monday, God willing. Amen. Okay. Bye-bye.